great. So can you see my screen now, Mohammed and everyone? Yeah. Great. So just let me just say hi to some people I see in the chat box. Hi, Lucy. Hi, Blanca. Thank you very much for coming. Um, hi. <laughs> and I also have my YouTube chat on the on the on on my right. So I'd like to make this as interactive as possible. So please feel free to use the chat box. There will be some moments where I will be asking, hello, uh, some questions. All right, everyone. I don't really like one-way webinars, so let's try to keep this interactive. Uh, so, uh, Jigs of Viewing Lessons, and I probably, my title should have been my what's, why's, and how's, right? So, what I do, why I do it, and how I use it. So, let's have a look at the steps um, of the session, all right? Yes, I will share my contact details uh, at the end. So, because I'm a big fan of reflective teaching and training, I'm going to start and end the session with a little reflection. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about my background to give you a little bit of context, right? Why am I talking about Jake's of viewing lessons, for example? What am I doing at the moment that uh, made me interested in talking about this topic? Uh, I'm going to list some uh, issues related to lesson planning. And then I'm going to tell you how I use a specific procedure or I suggest this procedure to my student teachers, uh, at the heart of which is jigsaw viewing. And this procedure um, addresses, let's say, most of these issues. Now, what we're going to do first is this. We rarely go to a session with an empty suitcase, let's say. We always bring something to that session, right? So I'd like to start with a little reflection, as I promised. And perhaps you have some ideas. Hi, Helen. Some ideas to share. So I'd like you to use the chat box, type number one in your answer, if you have any ideas about Jigsaw and how you use it in your classes. Perhaps you have some expectations, right? Why are you here? Maybe there's something that you want to, to learn or take away from this session, something specific. If that's the case, you can type number two in the chat box and your answer. Number three, maybe you have some questions, some doubts, something that is not clear, something that mm, you're worried about, something you don't understand. If that's the case, type three, uh, and in the chat box, you can type your question. And I'll just give you one or two minutes to do that. And I'll be monitoring the chat box. Uh, on YouTube and here on Zoom. Okay, Lucy says it's been a long time. Lucy says Jigsaw reading, right? So we can see that we can use Jigsaw uh, for uh, practicing different skills like reading, reading different material, then coming together to exchange uh, information and do something with it. Okay, Asma says I'd like to learn something from you. All right, okay, thank you, Asma. Let me have a look at the YouTube channel as well. Right, I have a great comment from my friend Helen. Learners can be grouped to work through tasks. Yeah, exactly. It's synonymous like with task-based, right? I use it for reading, great, receptive skills, reading. New ideas for Jigsaw, and I never doubt you. Thank you, Helen. Uh, lovely. Okay, a few more seconds to encourage people maybe to write a question, an idea, or an expectation. Lucy says, can I use Jigsaw for teaching one-to-one? -one? Well, um, I don't think so. Jigsaw, one person, unless you as a teacher, if you want to be like a participant, you can also contribute something. You can read something, watch something, let's say, and then with a student work together to exchange meaningful information. Yeah, that could be hard work for you, but I guess you can do it. Right, okay, so I'm going to continue. Um, and let's have a look at my background, as I said. At the moment, I'm mostly involved in teacher training. I'm only teaching one or two hours a week. And uh, what I do is I work with in-service teachers. Um, sorry, I'm going to um, mention a comment in the chat box. Peer learning. Yes, absolutely. Jigsaw Reading uh, develops and promotes peer learning. Thank you, Iman, for your comment. So I mostly work with um, in-service teachers uh, or inset. This means uh, teachers who are already practicing the profession for years, some of them from two years to up to 20 years, right? Very experienced 
uh, teachers. And what I do is I read, I mostly read lesson plans and I give feedback to teachers. And uh, when they give me their lesson plans, they also have to write a commentary where they describe and uh, they justify their approach that they're using or the combination of approaches, uh, any the methods or techniques, activities. They try to make a connection between theory and practice, right? They cannot just send a lesson, but they have to describe and justify every single thing uh, that they are doing in this uh, lesson plan. So have a look at these visuals, all right? And I'd like you to predict what could be the common issues I'm going to mention in the next slide? What issues do teachers usually have with planning? What do I usually address when I give them feedback? What points do I address? What is sometimes wrong in their lesson plans? Have a look and uh, write your answers in the chat box. Time management. Difficulty predicting, yes, how much time will I allocate here and there? Precisely, Helen, there's so much to consider, right? The stages, dealing with emergent language. What else, what else? Have a look at all the visuals. Let's get you predicting and guessing. Mm, they're not justifying their activities clearly, says Lucy. Confusion in instruction, enough time, differentiation. Yeah, it's catering for all needs, giving good instructions, reluctant to work. Yeah, students are yawning, right? Mm, a lot of work. Great ideas here. Assessment, okay. OCCQs, okay, predicting learners' needs. Here we have even more interesting ideas than the ones I've also prepared. <laughs> Questions, okay. Ah, integrating skills. Hmm. More about classroom management than teaching. I like that, Lucy, yeah. Well, keep them coming. These are some great ideas. Thank you very much. Time to get feedback from students at the end of the lesson. Wow, lots of great ideas here. All right, so let me also check. Well, I don't see any comments on YouTube. I don't know if I'm doing anything wrong. So uh, I'll just continue. Feedback throughout the lesson, exactly. What kind of feedback, Helen? Teacher's feedback, peer feedback, right? Uh, so let's have a look at uh, what I usually address when I read these lesson plans, what common issues do I encounter? So first of all, uh, there is a mismatch uh, between theory and practice. And what I mean by that is that uh, teachers state some beliefs uh, about teaching in their lesson plans, but these are they, they are, do not often agree with what actually happens in the lesson according to their lesson plan. Uh, so for example, uh, they say that they have planned a communicative lesson a cooperate, with cooperative activities, communicative activities, whereas, for example, they have activities mostly focusing on form, on language, practicing language, and maybe they do that in pairs and groups, but that is not considered a uh, communicative activity if they are doing a gap fill, for example, uh, in pairs. Uh, teachers want to have a learner-centered lesson, uh, but then it's very teacher-centered, says Helen. Yes, exactly, bingo, Helen. Um, so there is also uh, rarely any differentiation, as you mentioned uh, earlier. There is this lockstep teaching, like assuming all the students uh, want to do and will do the same thing at the same time, the same activity. Uh, there are no options. There are not different processes. Uh, and usually teachers are expected to plan lessons now also considering that element, considering differentiation, as well as communicative and cooperative elements. There are too many activities at times, uh, more than 10, 12, as you can imagine in a 60 minute lesson, uh, giving students more than 10 activities to do. It's like uh, they don't have time to breathe, not just you know, think and, and respond to the, to the content. So they're going from activity to activity. They're very tired by the end of the lesson. I think 
Yeah, no reflection exactly. And and they just want the lesson to end so they can go home, right? So the teacher is in control uh, of the content and of, and the process. And that's hardly motivating for students if they're just following instructions or should I say orders, uh, practicing, practicing. I mean, I've been in that kind of course and I really suffered and, and it was a German course, an intensive course. Uh, five of grammar and warning. I mean, can you imagine that? Uh, anyway, let's not go there. So lessons probably are not so motivating or memorable if students just, you know, wait for the class to end and they can go home. There is less is more, says Lucy. Lucy, I totally agree with this principle. Yes, absolutely. There is a lot of info. We give students texts, we give them videos or, or you know, audio listening. Uh, but what do they do with that information? They Usually, I, I've seen, for example, teachers writing in their lesson plan, read the text and underline the new words or watch the video and, uh, you know, find the new language or look up new words in a dictionary or do this true or false. But we need uh, students to do something meaningful, respond meaningfully to that content and more real life, more authentic also activities. Yes, processing time as well, not just go straight to language. They need to process for meaning, right? They need to process for meaning, very important. Now, planning takes forever if you have to plan a lesson that is, I don't know, includes 15 activities as well. Teachers are burned out by the end of this process when they have to plan five lessons per day and, and it takes so much time. They're usually very tired when they come to me and we discuss their, their lesson plans. And, and this also um, doesn't help them, doesn't motivate them to, to, you know, uh, to do a better job. I totally understand that. Chat box time. How would you address any of these issues? You can just pick one, the one that interests you the most. Uh, what would you do? What would you tell those teachers, perhaps? Uh, what could they do differently? Pick one and let me have a look at the chat box now. Oh, I see. I'm not sure if uh, these comments are recent on YouTube, TTT, ICQ, CCQs, including that. That's for checking understanding of language. Sure, Ellen says uh, observing other teachers, uh, see how another teacher differentiates. Or he can, they can read each other's plans because this is about lesson planning. But yeah, they could also see some effective examples of differentiation. Lucy says it depends on the size, age, motivation of class as well. Very good. Minimizing the content. Iman, I was thinking of, you know, content is important, but just giving them more opportunities to engage with the content in, a, in an authentic way. Do something communicative rather than just underlining words, for example, and doing lots of activities. I think content is important for uh, input in general, right? Uh, change methodology, uh, viewing lesson plans. Yeah, by another teacher. Exactly, Helen. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Some really nice ideas here. Uh, so let's move on. I'm also a bit mindful of time. And um, let's see. My voice is not clear. You can hear me. Is that? Yes. Can I get some feedback from everyone? Actually, it's, it's, it's pretty clear. Okay, okay, great. <laughs> Poof, there for a minute, I got a bit stressed. No worries. So what we're aiming for is communicative, cooperative lessons, students doing something with the content, with the information they get, thank you. Uh, differentiation, and Annie Altamirano also spoke about it in assessment yesterday. I'm going to mention some of her great ideas. Student control, choice, and responsibility, and not a large number of activities, 20, 30, et cetera, right? We try to reduce the number uh, of activities so that planning doesn't take forever uh, for the teacher as well. And hopefully this will lead to motivating and memorable lessons, right? So um, yeah, and Nora says, yeah, too many activities. We need to choose like relevant activities, engage students, moving from control, semi-controlled, or free. Yes, that is a framework, one of the frameworks that can be used. Exactly, thank you for your comment. So as I was preparing my presentation, I was lucky enough to, to uh, read this book, which is a must read, by the way. 
and it helped me uh, redefine also and understand communication as a purposeful interpretation and expression of meaning. Uh, this book is really great, and I was really happy to see that a lot of the things I'm going to mention today are also suggested uh, by the writers, and it has to do with applying uh, second language acquisition principles in our classes, so it's a must read. Um, oh, thank you, Helen. Great. Please uh, share links if, in the chat box if you can. So the writers of the book I mentioned, this one, um, talk about three modes of communication. And this really helped me understand how to plan also communicative lessons. They talk about a um, interpretive, first of all, um, uh, communication, which is students um, uh, analyzing interpreted content, whether that comes from a text or a video or uh, an infographic, for example, uh, and they understand that meaningful content. Then their presentational uh, communication mode is when they convey that information uh, for a given purpose to a specific audience. Uh, then interpersonal communication is when they interact with other peers, partners, interlocutors to exchange uh, that information for a reason. Now, I believe all three modes of communication are, uh, are being uh, developed in the procedure I'm going to show you now. And I'm just going to give it to you first so that you have a minute maybe to visualize the lesson. You can see the stages. Yes, thank you, Blanca. That's it. So as you can see, not a hundred stages, not a hundred activities, and don't worry, I'm going to explain them, uh, all of them in the next slides. If you uh, say, why video, why watch, why viewing, jigs of viewing or watching, whatever you prefer, uh, let's face it, students prefer videos nowadays. They engage more, um, it's more motivating for them than reading perhaps articles or, or just listening to podcasts. And... Uh, Video also is by modal input. It activates two channels for learning, uh, listening and reading. Uh, as Jake Young from Fluentize uh, put it in his article for Modern English Teacher, it's this visual element that helps learners fill in the gap. When there is unknown language, they will understand it perhaps uh, by looking at visuals or through the context. Uh, so it's quite helpful and engaging. Uh, and also the writers of the book said that perhaps some students might want to, uh, to just listen and close their eyes or others might want to just mute the video, just watch and see what's happening and then listen again. So it offers that kind of choice as well for students. And if you, it's, I, I know there's this uh, uh, confusion between this viewing and watching in the Sefer Companion, for example, you will find it as watching, watching TV, film and video under audiovisual comprehension. So we can have jigsaw reading, listening, uh, for example, and here we could call it jigsaw viewing or jigsaw watching. I think both are, are used. So what is the differentiated. Ah, Lucy says if there are captions, she stops listening. Okay, yes, exactly. So the differentiated lead-in would be to give students the topic, let's say if the topic is bullying, because we want to raise awareness of global issues, we tell them what is bullying. You can finish the sentence, you can draw it, what does it look like, or what does it sound like? Uh, maybe something that will come to them is a dialogue, right? Some exchange between people. Uh, or maybe they prefer to make a mind map, like write words connected uh, to the topic. Maybe this is how they, they prefer to engage with a topic. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about learning styles here. I'm just talking about differentiation and giving students choice uh, to express meaning in different ways. And also, you know, because maybe yesterday they did finish the sentence. Today they want to draw. They're feeling creative. Just giving them choice so that we don't control the process. So remembering my aims from earlier, this is a little differentiation, right? Uh, they will express meaning in different ways depending on, on what they prefer. And uh, as we said earlier, student control and choice. So I would use that and you can use it with most of the topics I believe that you want to teach, finish the sentence or draw it. And I'm sure you can come up with more ideas as well, more options. If you do, please put them in the chat box. 
Now, the next um, step, let's say, would be expert groups. Uh, and when we do chick, so this is a step where we divide the class into groups. Uh, each group here will watch a different video, right? And the different videos, uh, for example, would be uh, group one watches a video about cyberbullying, group two, social bullying, group three, physical bullying, group four, verbal bullying, right? Uh, and I would tell them to watch and I would give all of them the same first question. Like, is this the one you described in the first activity? And this would be just to raise that awareness, which was the first type of bullying that came to their mind and also to show them that there are many more types. Uh, so this would be at the first question. And then I would also ask them in, in their groups, their expert groups, to talk about the video and to consolidate their learning, right? To maybe create a bullet summary, a bullet point summary. What they could do is they could uh, watch with captions or without captions. And that again is a little uh, type of differentiation because if they have their own devices, they can choose, I want to challenge myself. I'm not going to use captions. Another weaker student might need captions because uh, they, they will find it uh, more difficult. So they can do what they like. They can rewind it, you know, replay as many times, pause, go back, listen again, uh, but maybe take some notes or, or look up any words in the dictionary. Why not? We do that in real life sometimes, don't we? Um, so they could do that. And uh, the role of the teacher, I think, here would be monitoring and just help them build that understanding, scaffolding the process, perhaps asking some questions when they're stuck. Uh, and listening to what they're saying, maybe giving some reactive feedback. Perhaps students are stuck, they just need that word, you know, and the teacher is there to help. Uh, so that would be this stage, uh, the expert groups becoming experts in one topic and together making perhaps a bullet point summary. So this is more communicative here, right? They're talking to each other, they're um, reminding each other some parts of the video, some keywords, and it's more motivating. The teacher is not really interrupting them. Uh, yes, Lucy, I agree. Their own devices, exactly. Uh, independence and support. The teacher is not interrupting them, is around and is helping. So hopefully this is more motivating than the teacher lecturing or giving them a lot of activities. Now we form jigsaw groups. So what happens here? We form groups and we... Uh, have students from different groups. So Emily watched the video about social bullying. Fiona watched the video about physical, etc. They all watched a different video. And what they do here is they have to mediate their texts, their, their summaries, perhaps. They have to tell each other. They have to exchange the information about each video. Uh, so some of them might want to look at the summary, right? The bullet point summary. Some would like to challenge themselves maybe, or look you know, at the summary sometimes and uh, flip the, pa the paper or something like that. So again, a little bit of differentiation here. Um, they might teach each other new words and concepts. So if Fiona doesn't understand what Maya says, she will ask, what is that word? What does that mean? Or what do you mean when you say this or that? So this is a great opportunity for them to teach each other, to create a little community of learning, uh, again, with a teacher only being around, monitoring, facilitating, not interrupting uh, or teaching everything. They will have had receptive exposure to a lot of input and nice language uh, related to the topic. So if they looked it up in a dictionary, they can help each other. And in this way, they're putting the, the pieces of the jigsaw, let's say, together. Uh, now we have, you know, I told you about my video, you told me about yours, all of us. So now we know what everyone watched, okay? The teacher again is helping, uh, again with reactive feedback or questioning, effective questioning, like Annie said yesterday, scaffolding the process, um, making sure that they're all on the same page. And here we have responsibility, right? Students are responsible. They all need to mediate their text, but also to listen to each other, make sure they understand or ask questions, clarification questions, repetition, anything. So um, the next step, you tell me, what is next? They watch different videos. They've come together. They've summarized their videos. What do you think should happen next? chat box time so I can have some water.
Mm. Increased agency, says Helen. Yes, absolutely. Time for reflection. I don't know. Is it yet? They've watched the videos. They've summarized the, uh, the videos. But what don't they have to do something with all that information? What do you think? Ah, sharing, discussion. Excellent. They need to do a task, says Helen. Presentation, create something. Lovely. Now you're getting warmer. Asking each other questions. Fantastic. A productive activity. Lovely. So we're on the same page, everyone. So we didn't just watch to summarize, right? That would be communicative practice, as the writers uh, really helped me understand the difference between communicative practice and real communication. So we need them to do something. What can they do? You had some great ideas. Uh, I agree with uh, most of them. So let's see. A discussion, as you said. Perhaps they can discussion is, is an authentic task, right? They could compare the types of bullying. And uh, for example, they could agree or disagree. Which one is more harmful? Which one is more serious? Uh, which one is more common in our context? So agree, disagree, justify their, um, their decisions. They could create a poster. They could um, make an anti-bullying campaign, create a poster with some solutions, and maybe they could put it up on the classroom wall or school corridors. They could record themselves. Uh, they could do a podcast or a video for social media, right? That's authentic. We upload videos uh, uh, and then we talk about things that interest us to raise awareness. Let me see the chat box, a poll, okay, graphic organizer and infographic also, right? Suggest ways to overcome it. Yes, brilliant ideas. Flipgrid, yes, I love it. I love it. Excuse me, write a letter maybe to the school principal. I'm sorry, I'm a little under the weather today. Mm. So maybe write a letter to the school principal, again, to, in an effort to raise awareness. And you came up with a lot of other great solutions and options. So you can see there is a differentiated final product. They're not all doing the same thing. They don't have to do the same thing. Uh, you can ask them to choose. But as this may take forever, in my experience, you tell them that, yes, Helen, with adult social media posts, absolutely. You can tell them you have one minute to choose or I will assign you know, uh, a product or a project to you. So this usually helps, otherwise they may talk about it forever and never ever decide. Um, and now they are doing something with that information. They're also not just transferring it, you know, from what they discuss to a piece of paper, they're filtering, they are, uh, they're being selective. They're, they have all the facts and they decide what they're going to keep, what interests them, and then they're going to use that in their final product. Um, so again, here, the teacher would be monitoring and doing that, facilitating, as Helen said, scaffolding, like building their understanding, giving some feedback rather than, you know, um, pre-teaching or teaching language that she can focus on what students need uh, at the moment when they are communicating. If she hears, uh, if they hear some, some words that students need help with uh, or ask some questions, as I said earlier, that's our role here. So we're not really interrupting or interfering. And this is the stage where students do something with the information. Remember that, very important. Uh, and hopefully it will make it more memorable. They will have decided the product they will have worked together. It's meaningful. It's authentic. It's something that uh, a speech, says Isaac. Yes, why not? Uh, a group speech, absolutely. And now uh, self-reflection. I usually advise teachers to include a stage for students to reflect, to become uh, more independent, to, to think about their own learning, to take ownership, as you said, of their own learning as well. And you can use a mind map. Uh, I've created this very simple one on Jamboard. Today's lesson, uh, and there are some bubbles uh, with some sentence stems. What I've learned, maybe they want to write words they picked up from the lesson, expressions, phrases, uh, key ideas, concepts, something about bullying. They can write what I already knew just to make them aware of their prior knowledge, their previous knowledge, and how it's helping them build new knowledge. Uh, a question they have, because usually students don't ask questions, right? I'm sure you've experienced that. 
um, they're a bit shy, they feel they will lose face in front of their teacher or uh, their classmates. I remember a teacher I had who said, good students are those who ask questions, who always ask questions, right? So I always tell my students that, uh, and I really encourage them to ask questions at the end of the lesson. What was difficult, perhaps to make them aware of any challenges they had. Uh, yes, they noticed their own progress, so motivating, absolutely. What they accomplished, says Helen. Uh, what was difficult and what they did to overcome it, make them, again, uh, aware of their strategies that they used, perhaps. And you see, I have other, other, I give them some extra bubbles for them to write something, you know, else that uh, might be useful. And uh, if you have some ideas, what would you include in these bubbles? Again, please, you can put them uh, in the chat box. Let me have a look. Right. So, and here, as you can see, if this is the, the final activity, right, not a large number of activities, you saw there were how many stages? Five stages. Um, and responsibility, encouraging students to think about their learning, to give themselves, you know, this to do the self-reflection, sort of a self-assessment, perhaps. Planning doesn't take forever. Uh, if you also use specific templates, provide links to students uh, for the different types of... Um, if it's... It can doesn't only have to be um, different types, like bullying, for example. It would be different perspectives, like one topic, two perspectives, right? So they could watch um, and they could uh, then come together and decide who they agree with. Uh, what I still need to know, yes, absolutely. Thank you very much for this. What I still need to know, yes. Uh, and what, how will I, I think, Ani Altamirano says, how will I learn it? What will I do? And something I am ready to pass on to someone else, brilliant. So I understood it so well that I can teach someone else, fantastic. We should do this session together next time, everyone. It's brilliant, brilliant ideas. So considering the three modes of communication, what I would do differently, yes, totally. Considering the three modes of communication that I mentioned earlier, interpretive, presentational, and interpersonal, I was inspired by that book. Uh, and I created a little grid, for example, uh, that, would, that could be self-assessment, and also the teacher could use it, and then perhaps the teacher could combine the self-assessment, the student's assessment, and the teacher's own assessment, and maybe uh, provide a final, let's say, assessment. As you can see here, there are the three uh, categories, interpretive, presentational, and interpersonal. And in the first one, what would be assessed uh, would be the ability to identify uh, keywords and ideas and details in the video and the peer summary, what I heard from my peers. In the presentational communication, what would be assessed uh, would be um, how many ideas they included, they actually included in their summary, and if their narration was easy to understand if they were intelligible, if they were clear, if, peer, uh, if their peers asked for clarification a little bit or a lot. And the interpersonal communication would be uh, what would be assessed here, listening to my peers and contributing some ideas, accepting peer feedback uh, respectfully, for example, being open to peer feedback or giving uh, peer feedback. Uh, perhaps I was a little harsh, says, uh, for example, the second column, or I gave respectful feedback. So to get them also to reflect on their interpersonal communication uh, on all three modes, right? I hope this is helpful. Um, I created it myself, but I'm open to feedback. Could you also use a grid like this to monitor and do some assessment? Yes, Helen, absolutely. I was thinking also that the teacher can use it and do that assessment then give that to the student. Students do their self-assessment and then these two can be combined in order to have a final, let's say, uh, grade. It's an idea. I look forward to reading your feedback. So if you want to make it more student-centered or if you have more advanced, let's say, learners, uh, you can replace this part with a web search. So rather than giving them the links, you know, social, bullying, physical, et cetera, you give them a topic and you ask them to do a web search. So it's more open, more unpredictable. They will have to find the content and they will have to also, you know, filter, evaluate the online information they plan to use. So this is an idea for an even more student-centered or a differentiated lesson. Some students have links to the videos 
other students do a web search because uh, they are a bit, you know, they want to be challenged more perhaps. And now we're back to the suitcase. So uh, I would like to see if you had any expectations, were they met, please type two uh, and your answer in the chat box. Uh, any questions, were your questions from before answered or maybe you have more, please type three uh, and your answer. And most, of, most importantly, is there any takeaway? Are you taking something away from the session? If so, please let me know. Uh, give me some feedback to motivate me. Uh, please type number four and your answer in the chat box. And I can have a look now and see what you're writing. You too, Mohammed. yes? <laughs> How long have it? Mm. I um, don't think it's more than a year. It's about a year, Helen. Yes, and I have uh, not used it so much uh, currently uh, because I have one-to-one um, -one classes and only one group class, but I am um, talking to teacher, uh, my student teachers uh, work in different contexts like in Egypt or in Italy or in Greece and they've given some really good feedback. They said that their students are really responding of course, it's not a magic formula, right? It's just one of the things that we can do, one, one procedure that has worked for us. Face-to-face mm, -face and online, haven't used it hybrid, sorry. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm glad it was clear. <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, it We're was Rachel. fun also. <laughs> thank we have, you. We have lots of comments here. Constant reflection. Thank you for that, Marcella. Yes, I, there are a couple of opportunities within the lesson to reflect. I like to do that, not just, you know, one stage. Uh, two, why not? Exactly. <laughs> well, thank you for your comments. Thank um, you. And I, I finished on time, right? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. So we have some comments to, to tell you. Uh, we have uh, Mrs. Iman Abdesalam. She's saying peer learning is an added value to jigsaw reading. Uh, Asma Sabri uh, is saying, I'd like to learn something from you. That's why I'm here. Of course, she's really knowledgeable, guys. That's why I've, I've invited her. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, I'm no. just, I'm a teacher, a newly qualified teacher trainer. I'm just here to share with my colleagues. Uh, the things that work, you know, in practice for me and my, my student teachers. This is my blog. Yes, thank you very much, Helen, for sharing. Uh, you can check out my blog and uh, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. I think I'm the only Rachel Sateri. I don't think there's anyone else yeah. with that difficult name. No. Uh, and yes, if you uh, want to contact me or connect with me, please do it. Uh, LinkedIn and my blog, The Teffel Zone. <laughs> 